As we read in our call to worship, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And I will admit to you that some of the chapters in the Old Testament are easier to come up with application than others. And today was more of a challenge than, than other days. And in a few weeks, um, Marcus is going to be sharing, well, I'm going to be out of town at a, uh, at a church reunion. Uh, they're uh, having the 50th anniversary for the church where I grew up. And they're having anybody who was a, a pastor or missionary that's, that's available to come back for that reunion to, to be there. And... Uh, the chapter Marcus gets is far more challenging than this one, and I was I was delighted in that. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, it, these are uh, this is the story of of Israel's change from being a theocracy where God was their king ruling over them, and they had a series of judges who who helped manage and and, and solve disputes. Their their law was relatively small. Uh, when you look at the first five books of the Bible, and really it's just a fraction of chapters of those books, which are actually the law by which their nation functioned. But it was the judge's, laws, uh, judge's job to interpret those laws whenever there was a dispute, maybe over property or, or the execution of one of those laws and how it played out in life circumstances. And so uh, after Moses had delivered them from Egypt and given them the law, then Joshua takes them into the promised land and each family is allotted a certain amount of land for an inheritance, and that is to be a perpetual inheritance for their family. Uh, you may be familiar with the concept of jubilee, which was every 50 years, land went back to its, its rightful owner. And, and, and really how that worked is that um, all leases were up every 50th year. Uh, so you could lease land from somebody, essentially, but on the 50th year, land had to go back to its rightful owner. And it was, it was one of the Lord's ways of ensuring that there would not be perpetual poverty in a family. If somebody had made poor financial decisions and had had to sell off their land, uh, at least every 50th year, the lease would be up. And, and, that, and you know, if you were born somewhere in the middle there and you were waiting for 25 or 30 years for your family to get the land back, you knew at least at some point in a normal lifespan, uh, your family would, would retain the ownership of that land. And it was intended to be that way. And, and, and so sometimes the judges had to work things like that out. We don't know if, if they ever really celebrated the year of Jubilee or not, which is interesting. Uh, there's not a whole lot of mention about the year of Jubilee after it was given. Uh, we know that they did not give the land its Sabbaths because that's why they ended up in Babylon. And the Lord said, while you guys are in Babylon for 70 years, the land will now get its rest because they, they planted even on the Sabbath year when they weren't supposed to. Uh, they were up and down for a while. They would follow the Lord and then they would stop following God and they would start worshiping idols and God would send uh, an enemy army or, or a an occupying force that would invade and, and pillage and whatnot. And then they would cry out to God after a while, and God would raise up a deliverer who would then also serve as their judge or their ruler. And Samuel, the, the book that we're reading, the, the, the account of Samuel, Samuel is that last judge. As we talked about a few weeks ago, his two sons, Joel and Abiah, were not uh, righteous men. They didn't follow after Samuel's way. They started right, but then they, they went and made some of their own wrong decisions in life. Political power actually got to them, and they began to corrupt justice and take bribes, the Scripture says. And so because of that, the children of Israel said, we do not want Joel and Abiah to be our next judges, Samuel. And we want a king. We want to be like all the other nations. We want our king to lead us into battle. And they're saying this one chapter after God had miraculously delivered them from the Philistines uh, by fighting, essentially fighting the battle for them. But yet they're saying, no, we want a king who's going to ride into battle and, uh, and, and deliver us from our enemies. We want to be like the other nations. Samuel is distraught both that his boys had turned out but poorly and distraught that that had caused the people to reject God's leadership over them and want an earthly king. And he tells them, no, you don't want to do that. They say, yes, we do. We don't care what it costs us. We want a king. And so God says to Samuel, that's fine. Let's just, let's just give him a king. And uh, so Samuel says, listen, the Lord's going to give you guys a king. Everybody go home. And that's where the story now picks up in chapter 9. So we've tried to br bring us up on about 600 years of their national history in just a few moments. So here we are at chapter 9, and a new character is about to be introduced into this narrative. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, 
His name was Kish, the son of Abael, the son of Zoor, the son of Becheroth, the son of Aphai of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could ever be found anywhere in Israel. And he was a head taller than everyone else. Sounds like a good guy. Nice and tall, right? Um, and uh, I, always, I always thought that was great what it said about Saul. But that is where I would hope that all of the similarities between my own life and Saul would stop. Uh, he, he ended up being actually a very poor leader, as, as we are about to find out. Uh, but, but he's what the people are looking for. And, and the writer Samuel here is emphasizing external appearance. Because you guys are looking for something. Here, the Lord is giving you, at least externally, what you're looking for. So now we find out a little bit more about Saul. Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father Kish were lost. This is a strange way to, to introduce this very important character over the next few years. Certainly an enormously important character for the Israelite nation. <laughs> he gets brought into the story with some lost donkeys. They were lost, and Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim, and you can kind of see this in your mind. This man and his servant are walking around, Here, donkeys, here, donkeys. You know, I don't know if the donkeys had names, and they're looking for donkeys. They're talking to farmers. Has anybody seen our donkeys? And this is, it's laughable, but it's how the story begins. So they passed through the hill country of Ephraim, through the area around Shalisha, but they did not find them. They went on to the district of Shalom, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find the donkeys. When they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. And we find out in the story, this has been days now that they have been out looking. They didn't bring a whole lot of food or anything with them. They thought they would find them quickly, and they have not found them. And days have elapsed in this fruitless search for the missing donkeys. But the servant replied, Look, in this town, there is a man of God. He is highly respected, and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now, and perhaps he will tell us which way to take. Perhaps this man of God can tell us or unravel the riddle of the missing donkeys. Saul said to his servant, if we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take the man of God. What do we have? And it's interesting at this juncture of the story, Samuel has been a judge for quite some time, yet it doesn't appear that Saul really has any idea of who Samuel is. They don't say, we're going to go see Samuel, the great judge of Israel. It's kind of like, yeah, I've kind of heard of this guy. And there's this rumor going around that there's a prophet or a seer, and he can tell you uh, where to find your donkeys, or he helps people find their keys if they lose them or their wallet. Or, you know, they, they, it's like they don't really understand or even have any awareness of really who Samuel is, and that's, that's kind of shocking that they, they have never heard of him or made his acquaintance. And the servant answered and said it to him again, Look, he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. So the servant has more faith in this situation than Saul does, and the servant is more determined. Saul just seems like, you know what, we lost a few donkeys. Let's go home. And the servant, no, no, maybe it was the servant's responsibility to keep track of the donkeys, and maybe he feels like it's my fault that the donkeys got lost. Maybe he's the one who forgot to shut the gate. We don't know. But the servant, for whatever reason, is much more determined to find these donkeys than Saul is. Surely Saul has a few coins in his pocket, but yet the servant, this, this poor servant, says he's rummaging through his pockets. Ah, let's see if the man of God will take this. Formerly in Israel, someone who went to inquire of God would say, Come and let us go to the seer, because the prophet of today used to be called a seer. So this verse 9 is probably a scribal footnote, maybe by David or Solomon or somebody a little bit later uh, after Samuel's writing who was explaining uh, the historical scenario. Good, Saul said to his servant, Come, let us go. So they set out for the town where the man of God was. As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some young women there who were coming out to draw water. 
And they ask them, and I can imagine Saul and his you know, rugged handsomeness saying, Hey, ladies, anybody know where the seer is? You know, that was like, it was a pickup line, perhaps. Is the seer here? He is, they answered. He's actually ahead of you. Hurry now. He's just come into our town today. For the people have a sacrifice at the high place. Now, the high place, each decent-sized city or, or village would have had um, a, a man-made earthwork, kind of a high place, if they didn't have a natural, naturally existing mountain or some place to worship. And and this is where they would worship. This was actually an ancient Canaanite pagan tradition to have a high place. It may go back, the tradition may go back as far as the Tower of Babel. Think of the Tower of Babel. What are they doing? Building this very high place to uh, worship God. And, and the interesting thing about the Tower of Babel is that they did not use conventional mortar. The scripture specifically points out that they were building a tower and they were using pitch, which is pine tar, which was a waterproofing agent. Now, why would the people after Noah's flood be building a giant tower that's waterproof? <laughs> okay, just in case God changes his mind, uh, we want to be able to get to higher ground and at least have, and, and I think this may have been some of the, the strategy in the original tradition was, let's be at a high place so that if it starts raining and doesn't stop, that we can cry out to God and we'll have a little more time than if we are worshiping God in the low place. It could also be they have a lot of astrology so that maybe we're closer to the stars, we're closer to the heavens. Uh, but every town, every sizable town would have had a high place. And as monotheism took over uh, with, with the Israelites, uh, they just worshiped God in those same high places. And there's no rebuke given. Uh, at this time, the temple's not built, okay? We don't even know if the tabernacle is still in existence. Remember, when Moses led them out, they built that tabernacle. But we know the ark was captured, and, and they went through many decades of not following God and then trying to follow God for a while. So is the tabernacle even still, you know, is it, is, has it been maintained and upkept or has it fallen into disrepair? So the, the worship of God came down to these prophets or seers who would travel around in a circuit like Samuel did, and then they would have kind of a, a festival and they would offer a sacrifice for sins or things like that, and then, uh, then they would proceed after that. So that's what this, this business is about the high place. And you'll see references to the high places throughout Scripture. Most of the time, it's in reference to idolatry, where they're worshiping Baal or something like that. As soon as you enter the town, the girls say, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterwards, those who are invited will eat. So go up now. You should find him at about this time. So uh, Saul and his servant... Uh, they went up to the town, the scripture says in verse 14, and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming toward them on his way up to the high place. Now a day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people for their cry has reached me. So this is similar to the cycle of the judges. The people have cried out to God for deliverance. But now God is raising up not a prophet, but he's saying, I'm going to let this guy be the king, and he will serve in that role as deliverer as well. Verse 17. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, again, they're at a distance. Samuel's walking towards the gate one way. Saul and his servant are walking the other way. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? So it's, it's pretty obvious from the text that he has no idea who Samuel is. They've never met before. Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, replied Samuel. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me. And in the morning I will send you on your way, and I will tell you all that is in your heart. In other words, I will tell you what you've come to inquire of me. But then he says this, As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, don't worry about them. And I'm sure Saul's thinking, well, wait a minute, that's what was on my heart. That's, that's really all I wanted to know. Where's the donkeys? 
As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, don't worry about them. They have been found. And then Samuel says something very strange. Remember, Saul didn't wake up this morning thinking he was going to go be, be anointed a king. He woke up looking for donkeys. That was his big job for the day. So Samuel says, And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line? And this is a really peculiar thing for Saul to hear. He's just kind of processing it. And it's a strange construction of a sentence for Samuel to have said it in that way. Saul answered, and apparently Saul realizes that you're talking about some type of a leadership role, because Saul answers him, but am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? They had had a, uh, some unfortunate things happen that had uh, uh, decimated the population of their tribe, if you read back through the book of Judges. Is not my clan the least of all the clans of that tribe? So not only am I from the least clan, I mean the least tribe, we're from the least clan in that tribe. Why would you say such a thing to me? And th this probably shows that Saul has a little bit of humility and he kind of understands the pecking order. Um, Benjamin is the last born son. You, you wouldn't choose a leader from the tribe of the last born son. Wouldn't you choose it from the first born son? Well, we know, because you guys were here for the study on Joseph, that the first born son, Reuben, had fallen out of favor. And so the leader would eventually come from the tribe of Judah, the next one. All right. Samuel, then Samuel brought Saul and his servant into the hall. So the, the sacrifice is over and they're in this banquet area and seated them at the head of those who were invited, about 30 in number. Samuel said to the cook, bring the piece of meat that I gave you, the one I told you to lay aside. So the cook took up the thigh with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. And if you go back into the, old, uh, into the law, uh, the thigh was the portion that was set aside for the one who was offering the sacrifice, for the priest or the Levite who was the one offering the sacrifice. So this is Samuel's portion, and he's now giving it to Saul. There's some, there's some subtle significances here. In other words, there's going to be a transition of leadership. You're getting the portion that was given to me. Here has what has been kept for you. Eat it, because it was set aside for you for this occasion from the time I said I have invited guests. And Saul dined with Samuel that day. And Saul doesn't know what's up. But I'm sure Samuel's peppering him with questions just to find out what kind of a leader he's going to be. After they came down from the high place to the town, Samuel uh, talked with Saul on the roof of his house. They have this conversation that goes late into the night. Uh, the, the housetop was a place where they would house guests. They might have a canopy up there to protect them from the sun, but it was a cool place to sleep in the evening. They arose at about daybreak, and Samuel called to Saul on the roof. Get ready, and I will send you on your way. And remember, he still has said, the next day I'm going to tell you everything that's in your heart. When Saul got ready... He and Samuel went outside together, and as they were going down to the edge of the town, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. But you stay here for a while so that I may give you a message from God. Now you'll have to come back next week to find out what that message is, because the chapter stops there. God is getting ready to give them exactly what they've asked for. If they were making a list of what they would have wanted, God's getting ready to give them what's on their list. This tall, good-looking guy, he's got some humility about him. He's from a good family. But what's interesting is, and you and I have the advantage of, you know the rest of the story, that at the very time that they are getting ready to have Saul as their king, there's the sound of stones hitting trees and rocks and bushes, and it's David, miles away, practicing his slingshot. And none of, they don't know that, and David doesn't know that, but the Lord knows it. And, and there's this one who's after God's own heart, who's of the right tribe, who's going to end up becoming their king. There's David out there on the hillside, just singing songs, playing his little guitar, watching the sheep. 
children of Israel are about to get a dose of what happens when you say, my will be done instead of thy will be done. But it does start off pretty good, as you're going to see in the next few chapters. Uh, Saul doesn't uh, make too many terrible mistakes. In fact, he starts off on the right track. And he's given every opportunity to be a good leader. I want you to know in this story, and again, this is one that's maybe a little bit more difficult to, to make application, but I think that there is something that's maybe hidden in plain sight. Look at all of the circumstances that had to take place for the events to unfold the way that they did. As I read through this story, it almost reminded me of the story of Esther. And in the, in the, in the account of Esther, God's name's never mentioned a single time. Yet, all throughout the story, there's this perfect timing that keeps happening. Events and things keep happening at just, just the right... And what is it demonstrating? Even though God's name is never mentioned, he's, he's working out a plan. The king can't sleep. In walks Haman. You, you know, I mean, everything in that story of Esther. And I think we kind of see that happening in this chapter here. The donkeys wandered off. And Kish and his servants, they were just mad as they could be that the donkeys had wandered off. They didn't know why the donkeys had wandered Who had caused the donkeys to wander? God. Kish doesn't just send a servant. For this occasion, for whatever reason, he sends his son along with the servant. Their search for the donkeys brought them near Samuel at the very time that Samuel's circuit brought them near him. It's an amazing set of circumstances that are in play here. The servant has some knowledge about the seer uh, who's in this town, and he also has the means to offer a gift and the willingness to offer a gift. The girls from the town know right where Samuel's going to be. The first person, when they walk through the gate, that they speak with is Samuel. God has already informed Samuel miraculously of what will happen. So what does this reveal to us? It reveals that God is sovereign and that he is working out a massive plan of redemption. The line of kings had to begin because Messiah was on the way. And God gave them the people's choice first. And the second king is more of God's choice, David. It reveals to us that God is sovereign and he's working out his massive redemptive plan through the very ordinary and at times the extraordinary events of everyday life. Looking for donkeys is a pretty normal thing. Having God reveal to the prophet that this man's going to walk through here tomorrow, that's pretty extraordinary. But it's both the ordinary and the extraordinary. And I think sometimes you and I, we think God only moves in the extraordinary in Scripture, there seems to be this unusual fusion of the two, right? The, the, just the ordinary stuff of life and then sometimes gets fused with the extraordinary as God is working out his sovereign plan of redemption. And so from this passage, what I want to challenge you this morning is to be prepared. Be ready for the everyday divine encounters that God has prepared for you. It's interesting in, in, in uh, Hebrews, it says, let us run with endurance the race that is, huh, as if God already has prescribed the course. We don't know, we're just running. Oh, the sign says go this way. Oh, the sign says go that. We're just running the race. But God has prescribed the course. Just as he had prescribed the course for Saul and Samuel to have this intersection at the right moment, at the right time, in the right place. God has divine encounters for you and me. And with all that's going on in our world, we might wish that things were different. In fact, I think all of us can probably agree that we wish things were different. We might pine for things to have been the way that they used to be or things to be better than they are now. But God has sovereignly placed you and me right now in this time, in this era. He's put you in the job that you have. He's given you the relationships that you have. He's going to bring people in and out of your life for a purpose. And it's part of his redemptive plan. And, and some days you're going to notice something seemed extraordinary today. And other days it's just going to be the normal stuff of life where God is moving and working his sovereign plan. I, I don't know about you, but one of the frustrating things about my life is too often I feel like I see God's hand moving, but I see it in the rearview mirror. 
Like I already missed the opportunity. I didn't see it in my windshield. I see it in the rear view. And so, so how, can we, how can we be the kind of people that see it in the windshield rather than the rearview mirror? And I think that question is answered in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus, and here's what he says. See then that you walk circumspectly. We'll break that word down in just a moment. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. I think we can agree that the days are evil in which we live. So what does it mean to walk or live in a circumspect way? Circa, circle, spect, think of spectacles. So walk being aware with your eyes open, being aware of your surroundings, being aware of the culture in which you live. And, and so when you watch the news, rather than only just having some sort of reaction to it one way or the other, think, okay, how is God working in the world? How do I respond to this in a way that brings the hope of the gospel and the light of the gospel uh, into this situation? See then that you walk circumspectly, aware of what's going on in the world around you. Not as fools, but as wise. Then it says, redeeming the time, and many translations put this, making the most of the opportunities. We can't afford, the days are evil, we can't afford rearview mirror stuff. We've got to see it in the windshield. And so we have to live with that awareness that God is sovereign in the, the events and things that happen in my day are divine appointments and divine encounters. I have a dear friend who says Psalm 37, 23. He says this every morning. He's a very disciplined Christian. All right, And so he, he's one of these people who has put habits and things in his life. And so every morning when his feet hit the floor and he takes his first step from the, from the bed to the, to the bathroom or the dresser or whatever, whatever his first step is, here's what he says. Psalm 37, 23, he says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his way. And it's this man's reminder of saying, okay, the steps that I'm taking today have been ordained by God. He's going to direct my path. He's going to bring people in across my path that I otherwise wouldn't have met. There's going to be things happen today. And it's, it's his way of, of seeing, of looking at life through the windshield instead of the rearview mirror, saying the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. When you leave this place today, Throughout the, the rest of the day, it might be at a restaurant. It might be meeting with family. Tomorrow, if you uh, head off to work or, or just as you're out and about, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. God has a, a purpose, and there's going to be divine encounters in each of those situations as God is working out his massive redemptive plan through the ordinary and the extraordinary. Paul said this to the church at Galatia as we close. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, Jesus is living his life through me by the Holy Spirit. God is encouraging people through me. He's touching people's lives through me. He's bringing encouragement, whatever, healing, hope, whatever. God's bringing that through us. We are his hands and feet in this world. And the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do that. Please, my challenge today is be ready for the divine encounters in the ordinary and the extraordinary. Father, I pray that you'd help us to see the opportunity and seize the opportunities. That as you bring us into different circumstances and as you bring circumstances into our lives and people into our lives and situations on a daily basis, both the extraordinary and the very ordinary. Help us to understand that you are sovereign over all. None of this is a mistake and you have brought us to these places and these people at these times for your purpose, your ultimate redemptive plan in this earth. So help us to be aware of that, that you are longing to bring men to yourself to bring sinners to repentance. So help us to live as lights in a dark world and live with purpose. Even in the ordinary days, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.